Along with the tourism industry, cultural and creative sectors are among the most affected by the current crisis. And in these unprecedented times, the OECD is joining forces with its partners to understand these impacts and to also see how cities, regions and national governments can support the sectors. We organize a series of talks in April. Uh, last Friday, together with ICOM, we focused on museums. And today, and this webinar is now available online, and today we'd like to look at the creative sectors more broadly. Of course, there is no uniform definition of creative sectors, but these typically include heritage sectors, libraries, archives, film, performing arts, dance, opera, theater, all these things that we're terribly missing today, music industry, books and press, design and game industries, radio and TV, and architecture. These sectors are very important for our cities and regions. They create jobs, and these jobs uh, have proven to be resilient after the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, and these sectors generate revenues. They make our cities and regions attractive for visitors, businesses, and talents, and they contribute to people's well-being, of course. Creative industries also have a very important role in regional innovation. Through cross-innovation with other sectors, through a more innovative workforce, and also through innovation within the sector itself, through new ways of working, new ways of reaching audiences, and new ways of co-production. All these areas are very important for local development, and will be even more so in the recovery. So it is in this broader local development perspective that we would like to place our debate today. And I would like to thank our partners, the European Creative Business Network, the European Commission, World Cities Culture Forum, and Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center led by Nesta in the UK. And now, uh, together with my colleague, Professor Pierluigi Sacco, Senior Advisor and Head of the OECD Venice Office, we are very pleased to introduce our speakers. And you'll see them live in a moment. Today, together with us, we have Justine Simons, OB, Deputy Mayor of London for Culture and Creative Industries and Chair of World Cities Culture Forum. We also have Gianpaolo Manzella, who is joining us from Rome, where he is under secretary in the Italian Ministry for Economic Development. Bernd Fezel, Managing Director of European Creative Business Network. Hassan Bakshi, Executive Director, Creative Economy and Data Analysis at Desta in the UK. Joanna Gomez Cardoso joins from Lisbon, where she's president of the Lisbon Municipal Agency that manages theaters, museums, monuments, and organizes city street festivals. We also have with us Philip Kern, founder and managing director of KIA, one of the leading research centers on cultural policy. Barbara Stacher joins from the European Commission, Director General for Education and Culture. Justina Jacum joins us from Australia, where she is CEO of Festivals of Adelaide. Pierluigi, I'm very pleased to give the floor to you now. A very challenging discussion where uh, clearly there are so many different issues to be addressed. So I will give a, a short uh, panorama of what are today the main points to be discussed and uh, also, of course, the challenging questions for our panelists. So over. Yeah, the first point to note is that uh, SMEs are heavily affected, heavily affected by what's happening, by the crisis, irrespectively of the sector. What you see here is a snapshot of a few evidence that has been collected and uh, reported in this uh, just published uh, report on SME policy responses by OECD to the COVID crisis. And you see by yourself how dramatic these data are. In China, we have one third of SMEs that only have cash to cover fixed expenses for one month. Uh, there is, uh, of course, even in highly integrated uh, countries like Germany, almost one third of the samples SMEs expects a more than 10% decline, decline in turnover for 2020. In Italy, the, this decline and the expected decline is even bigger and uh, there are uh, clearly affected sectors that are so central to, for the national economy like transport, tourism, fashion and agri-food. In Japan, uh, there's been uh, reported the supply chain disruption for 39% for the sample SMEs, even uh, uh, even the Korean situation where, as we know, the reaction has been particularly effective to the coronavirus and nevertheless 42% of the SMEs cannot operate beyond three months, 70% beyond six months, 
also due to the interconnections, of course, with China. And uh, also there is a clear sentiment that the crisis is perceived to be much worse than the 1997 Asian crisis and the 2008 uh, global financial one. And um, the supply chain disruption for uh, USA amount to 70% uh, of the survey businesses uh, that uh, mostly uh, belong to the small and medium sized sector. Uh, okay, so over. In the case uh, of uh, the specific culture and creative industry, this, this uh, worrying scenario is further complicated by some uh, structural aspects. First of all, CCIs are very fragmented. So we know how big the share of small and micro firms and freelance professionals is in the sector. So in this case, the income breakdown has often been dramatic with no future prospect or with any clear deadline. And of course, uh, in addition to this, the traditionally limited access to credit for this kind of professionals and companies can basically wipe away uh, substantial portions of the whole productive fabric of cultural creative industry. Nevertheless, uh, we are also seeing some interesting perspective in terms of the role of digital access that clearly is skyrocketing and is creating a new situation that also presents opportunities. But the point is, first of all, how is it possible for, especially for small companies and freelancers to have uh, viewers pay for content and more generally how they can upgrade their own technological and sometimes even human capital skills to live up to the new challenge of this massively digitalized creative economy. Uh, also, another interesting point to notice is that uh, the pervasiveness of uh, culture in our, uh, in our uh, lockdown li lives in this moment is also particularly interesting because for many people, it's also revealed how important, I would even say fundamental is, access to culture and creative content to preserve our uh, health uh, and well-being sometimes, and uh, more generally, how the dimension of uh, impact from a point of view of uh, the capacity of culture to create uh, strong emotional and cognitive reactions is probably also paving the way to a new conception of culture where the impact dimension, the social impact dimension, the health impact dimension, can also create new market opportunities and even define new professional figures. Next. Clearly not all uh, local economies are the same. What you see here are, for example, a few different countries where, again, from OECD data, we see what is the difference in terms of share, share of employment in the creative and artistic and entertainment sectors in seven different countries. And you see that both the national and the regional variation is huge. So it's very important in this analysis to consider that uh, there's no recipe that is universal. We really have to have a country and even region specific recipes depending on the specific structural characteristics. Okay, next. So how to cope with the crisis? At the moment, there's been a very little coordination. There is a very diverse uh, range of uh, strategies and approaches that have been deployed by different countries and even by different regions or cities. Uh, here we list uh, just a few of the ones that have been uh, reported so far. For example, in Italy, there is now a substantial uh, emergency fund for live art cinema and audiovisual, and also a voucher system for tickets already bought that at the moment is 130 million euros, which is a substantial measure. For Belgium, for example, there is a general purpose, not specifically targeting culture and creative industry, 50 million euro fund that of course also cover, covers the, the, the creative sectors. And in particular, there is also a new task force for uh, implementing a new uh, approach to digital st streamed, digitally streamed cultural content. Sweden has a 90 million emergency funds for culture and sports together. And France is developing a very articulate strategy of support actions for cultural subsectors. Then there are uh, specific cities like Barcelona and Berlin that are also providing support, also like in the case in Berlin in terms of cash transfers and more generally specific support measures, especially when, of course, the, the restriction will be lifted and it will be again possible to have cultural productions, even Tokyo. Uh, we have just learned uh, are, is developing now specific measure for its local uh, uh, creative sector. Next. Uh, this also means 
that uh, clearly, as we said, that there is a, a emergency uh, strategy that is needed at various levels, but at the same time, there are also several emerging opportunities that we have to consider. First of all, this massive digitalization that is clearly not temporary, is there to stay, could really create new forms of experience and dissemination whose market potential is completely yet to be discovered. So there is a room for substantial experimentation also in terms of business models here. Uh, clearly, the role of emergent technologies and especially technologies that improve the capacity of presence, uh, uh, distance, uh, in some sense, presence at a distance in specific cultural environments like uh, augmented and enriched reality will probably have uh, a massive boost in terms of how they can contribute to this new model. Uh, of course, also these new models, these new forms of digitally mediated and decentralized creative production can engage larger communities, not simply from the receiving end, but also in terms of content production. So it will be possible probably to have more inclusive forms and, and more, uh, in some sense, innovative forms of collective authorship of digital content in a new situation. At the same time, whereas most the production chains are today experiencing a global breakdown, the, especially the digitalized side, of course, of the, of the culture and creative sectors may become now even more global than currently is because clearly here, many of the restrictions that affect other sectors are not really biting. And of course, we have to consider even strategic complementarities with sectors like the educational one or the welfare one that, of course, open new possibilities again. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, this also leaves space for the public side. Is, uh, for example, this an opportunity for, for example, a public initiative to create new platforms for the delivery and dissemination on the on culture and creative content also outside of the most uh, commercial parts of the culture and creative ecosystem and how this can help redesign the global content ecosystem itself. And finally, of course, there can be a stronger integration between the culture and creative industry itself and sectors that are generally less industrialized like museums or theaters and libraries. And so how this kind of complementarities again could uh, create new opportunities that can uh, help and enhance the sustainability of uh, non-industrial uh, uh, cultural institutions like, that are uh, so much relying on, uh, on public transfers like museums and theaters and libraries. Next one. So uh, in this panorama, we have three basic questions that we want to uh, that we want to offer to our panelists today, and uh, we will have three rounds in which we tackle each of them uh, specifically. The first one is clearly what are the short and long term expected impacts from, of, of the crisis on the CCIs. The second one is what kind of innovative solutions are being or should be pursued, and finally, what kind of policy support actions are really needed both in the long, in the short and the long term. Okay, so we are now opening the first round uh, of, of discussion. Katya, uh, can I, 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 I know, okay, very good. So first round is what are the immediate and medium term impacts of the crisis on cultural creative sector? So more specifically, what we are asking to our uh, panelists is, what are the most affected sectors in your city or country and what are the short and long-term impacts in terms of employment and business survival and what kind of long-term consequences the crisis will likely have for cultural institutions like museums, theaters, libraries, concert halls and will this digital dimension become a permanent pillar of their programs? What kind of complementarities will this spark with culture and creative industries? So very rich very rich array of questions. And so it's my pleasure now to give the floor to the first speaker, Bernd Faisal. Thank you, Pierluigi, um, for, um, for the floor. And thank you, Katarina, for inviting me. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Now I want to show um, to you the result of a survey we did, um, a survey which originated from Kreatives Sachsen in Germany and which we then used for the whole of Europe. We had some 7,000 um, participants in this survey asking what is the expected loss. Uh, this is until um, the end of 2020. 
And this was asked at the very beginning in March. And you can see here that 10% um, expect to have a 25% uh, loss. Um, no, that, that you have 25% uh, of, the, uh, of the participants expecting some 10% of their turnover to be lost. Uh, another 25, uh, almost 25, expect to lose 20% uh, of their turnover. And uh, amazingly in this survey, I think, was that only 9.9% .9 of the participants expect to lose 50% of their turnover by the end of the year. So while there is a very um, uh, big audience losing slightly 10 to 20 percent, um, I think the result of showing um, this big loss of 50 percent or more, um, that there is a resilience within the sector to endure uh, this shutdown and this lockdown. Next slide, please. We also asked uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, what is the um, result now? What are you expecting to lose? And 14% um, of the audience expected to lose 10% right now. Another 20% expect to lose uh, 30%. And then uh, much more, uh, up to 50% was the loss uh, immediately now, was 11%. And in the long term, until the end of the year, this was below 10%. Um, so you see here that the immediate lockdown uh, could not be coped with at all, which is not really a surprise. I think we all realize this from our daily experience, but it's um, valuable to see this uh, by such a statistical audience of almost 7,000 questionnaires uh, to prove to policymakers that they also have to react now and not only in the long term. And as we all know, if, it's what, if there is something difficult for policy, it is to react in such a short term. Next slide, please. As we see with the virus and the capacity of um, our um, system in general, our health system across Europe, there's also a stress level um, of um, uh, of the companies to resist this shock and what kind of measures are necessary to keep our sector below this stress level, below uh, really having massive failures and bankruptcies um, because of the short term of this lockdown and because of there is no president's cases to relate to, it's really almost impossible to say where is this level uh, this stress level and so we um, created some scenarios to ask ourselves how could this stress level be defined where do we see the threshold of a really dangerous um, default of the sector next slide please so you see four scenarios now which are clustered around uh, two main thoughts one is um, a timeline, optimistic, opening up soon in April, uh, pessimistic uh, lockdown until the end of the year. And the other one is something Pierluigi has been relating to already. How is uh, the market structure? Are you mostly selling locally and are closed now and maybe have some global digital sales, but this is a margin? Or are you basically a global and now open company, which is based upon a digital sales model. So um, it will come not to a surprise that uh, scenario one is uh, the most favorable when you have a global company selling now digitally um, and if it's opened up soon again, a return is possible only with the losses of uh, the first scenario of the first uh, round of statistics where the loss was about 20% um, of turnover now. So this is something uh, which you can handle and come back. Uh, the second scenario is harder. Uh, you are still operating globally and have an open business model thanks to the digital sales, but opening uh, of the local sales is, sales is only at the end of the year. We call this second scenario uh, return hard, but possible. 
because until then about 10% of the sector will have about 50% uh, a loss of their uh, turnover. The third uh, one in the bottom left uh, is the optimistic timeline opening soon, but still you are closed now and only main, mainly selling locally. Um, we call this scenario return unlikely. And the most difficult one is obviously you're locally closed now and opening up only at the end of the year. And this is uh, at the moment materializing with a lot in the life sector. Life sector is not alive any longer. And we have to be really um, careful if this sector can recover, if it's only opening up at the end of the year. We, called, we call this scenario return near to impossible. You will have then uh, like 40% of the sector will have more than 50% loss of their turnover. And this is not just a, a crisis in turnover, but this then is a structural, a system crisis for the market. Yeah, Katarina, that's my input. Um, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Bernd. Uh, this was uh, very, very useful and of course, uh, painfully instructive in terms of uh, the risk, the level of risk that uh, especially some parts of the CCIs are facing in this particular context. And uh, I am particularly uh, impressed by the idea that uh, mitigation strategies here is not simply a problem for epidemiologists, but it's really also a policy problem. And uh, so far, of course, everybody's th th thinking in terms of support, but not in terms of mitigation strategy and carrying capacity of the system. And I find this perspective particularly useful and illuminating. Thank you for this. So I would like to give the floor now to Justine Simons that offers as a double perspective that of the City of London and uh, also of the World the Cities Culture Forum. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. This is a, a really, really valuable forum. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit from the perspective of the World Cities Culture Forum and then I'll talk a bit about the specific uh, London perspective. So over the last few weeks, I've been chairing a weekly call with different global cities. We've had a spotlight on Europe, a spotlight on Asia, a spotlight on the US, just to look at what themes are emerging, what strategies are emerging, what we can learn from each other, um, and especially because many world cities are at different stages in handling this pandemic. Our Chinese colleagues are further down the road than some of our European colleagues. Um, so there's lots to be shared and learned. I, I'm just going to talk about the nine themes that have emerged over these recent weeks, and they, um, they do chime and reflect a lot of what was spoken about at the beginning in terms of the overarching themes. Um, so the World Cities is a group of 40 global cities, so it's mega cities around the world uh, in all continents. And um, to talk to the themes, um, the first common theme around all the cities is data capture. So everyone is interested and most people are commissioning data captures. So everyone wants to know the answer to the question, what is the economic impact of COVID on the creative industries? So that's theme number one that's in common. Um, theme number two is the rush to digital, culture moving online. Uh, and that is both the opportunities of that and the challenges. A particular concern of world cities is um, that although COVID has created a feeling of generosity and lots of content is being given away for free, we know that artists are one of the hardest hit section of the economy and we don't want the rush to online to further disempower artists. We need to pay artists for their digital work. So that is a theme too. Um, Theme three is all major cities, all cultural leaders in major city administrations are mainly now focused on building against for culture because we're sitting alongside colleagues with business priorities in a wider sense, health, education, social care, um, and we want culture to be absolutely at the table, to be part of the solution and to be part of the story. But we know that that won't happen without advocacy. So 
we are all busily building our arguments uh, as to why culture needs to be part of integrated part of the strategy. Um, number four, um, culture and mental health also been spoken about today. So a lot of people are, of course, in isolation, um, dealing with difficult mental health issues and culture has absolutely come to the fore here. Um, we've seen virtual choirs, we've seen uh, music projects. Um, so there's a big kind of shift there around the role of culture in mental health um, and a recognition of the value of culture in these times. I think this has come front of mind to people. Number five, um, I think what we've seen is some of the fragility in the labour market um, and some of the issues come into sharp relief through COVID. So um, the fragility of employment conditions, artists, practitioners, freelancers, already a fragile part of the uh, cultural economy, now even more fragile. It's amplified those problems uh, that we already have systemically in the, uh, in the system. Number six is the opportunity. Uh, we're interested in uh, what might be the opportunity here uh, to reposition culture. So we have all turned to culture in COVID. Um, and also culture is one of those areas, the creative economy is one of those areas that will be able to accelerate the recovery program in cities. So we're interested in um, what is that opportunity to reposition culture at the heart of the recovery. Um, I would say number seven, the seventh theme is we're talking now a lot about unlocking, unlocking culture. So, um, you know, masks will be a way of life. How do we cope with social distancing in cultural venues, in events? Um, we are, everyone is looking at a staged unlocking throughout uh, to come out of COVID. And it's not clear what that means in terms of cultural events, cultural activities, theatres, music, etc. Um, some of our colleagues in China have been modeling 50% capacity. So if there's a theatre of a thousand people, they sell 500 seats, how does that work? Does that maintain enough social distancing? Um, so people are testing things. The reason that this is so important for us is that we have got to get it right. And if we don't get it right, lives are at stake. So it's absolutely front of mind um, for lots of world cities and what kind of advice they can give. Um, I'd say the eighth theme is behavioural change and public confidence. Um, how will people feel going back into theatres? Again, from our Chinese colleagues, they are reporting a lot of public faith and public confidence in going to the theatre and going to music venues, etc. So there's definitely a theme emerging about uh, trust and confidence uh, in civic and uh, cultural events. Uh, and then the final theme I would say is equity and inclusion. So what we're seeing is that we have got to work even harder to reach those groups of society that have been traditionally excluded or marginalized. There's a very clear risk that relief packages reinforce existing inequalities. Um, and so we're seeing in many cities ideas about how we can facilitate uh, communities and groups who are less likely to apply for funding or come to it late to, give, to get them to the front of the queue. Soft launches of fundraising programs, for example. Um, colleagues in, uh, in the States were reporting that they were opening up relief programs and after 24 hours, they were completely oversubscribed and full. Um, and so we've got to be very, very mindful as city leaders and city policymakers that we don't allow this emergency response to uh, reinforce and deepen existing inequalities in our cities. Um, so I would say they are the nine things so far that are emerging from our conversations and they do chime a lot with what we've heard already um, at the start of this. And then just quickly to move on to the London picture to give you the London um, story. So unsurprisingly, uh, culture and the nighttime economy in London has been dramatically impacted. All public events are cancelled or postponed. But we saw a collapse even before the formal government lockdown. So people had stopped going to the theatre, stopped going to cinemas before the formal mandated government lockdown. Also, we are seeing a long tail effect. 
So current production freezes, lack of deals in the pipeline, all of these things have stopped for later on. So in a way, the lockdown period is a kind of slice in the middle, but there is a before and an after um, umbrella around it, creating a long tail effect. Um, and all of this adds up to quite a catastrophic impact on an industry in London that is worth 52 billion a year. One in six jobs in London is a creative one. And there is also an additional 40 billion pounds uh, in our supply chain. So that's carpenters and hairdressers and the support services in the supply chain that support the core creative economy. So it's a massively important industry. It's the biggest growing. It's the least likely to become automated but it has been catastrophically hit right now. Um, in terms of the structure of our industry, um, the set, similar to everyone else, um, SMEs make up 99.9% .9 of the creative economy in London um, and 50% are freelancers. So it's a very fragmented uh, picture. Our latest uh, industry polling shows that 60% of creative organisations can't last longer than 12 weeks and that polling was two weeks ago so in 10 weeks time we're predicting a cliff edge so the picture is quite bleak um, what i'll just do now is dig down to the two most affected areas um, so one is individual freelancers and artists covid has thrown into sharp focus these structural weaknesses in the labor market um, the creative practitioners who are the lifeblood of this industry are very fragile. They are at the margins of the power structure. Um, freelance creators have job insecurity, poor pay and working conditions, and also funding is largely channeled through uh, institutions. So lots of cities and around the world, my colleagues in city governments are all uh, trying to think about how they can address the, the challenge of supporting freelancers and individuals when historically, regional government does not deal directly with freelancers. It deals with institutions um, and third party organizations to distribute funds and packages of support. So this power balance has been exposed and we're seeing lots and lots of cities and institutions grappling with how they can kind of bridge those gaps in this emergency. Um, I would say the second most, um, digging down the second biggest area of impact in London, if you dig down is grassroots culture. So before COVID, London's grassroots cultural infrastructure had faced huge losses over the last decade. Um, LGBT plus venues, uh, grassroots music venues, nightclubs, artists, workspace, creative studios, all of those have been in steep decline. And these areas have been a priority for the current mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. So since 2016, we have prioritized support for what we know to be this vital element of the ecosystem. You know, without those craftspeople, without those people kind of generating the creative content, the entire industry falls apart. They are the kind of engine room of it. Um, and in terms of our, and what, so what we've seen is, again, a kind of amplification of risk around those venues. So one of the um, things we've done is um, we have a culture at risk office in London. I call it the bat phone. It's the phone that people call if they need help. And we've supersized it, we've redeployed half a team into it. So we've really beefed up our support services through our culture at risk office. And we're hoping to bring some funding into that too. Um, we now predict that 90% of London's grassroots music venues are facing permanent closure. So we've got a really, really big task to do there to support them. Um, the other thing that's happening here is that the government has introduced, the national government has introduced many support measures but there are big gaps in that and many in the creative sector are falling through the gaps in the safety net. So at City Hall, we're doing a great deal of government lobbying to amend the packages, to fill the holes in the safety net that the national government has provided in order to support our creative sector. Um, I would say the other two points that are emerging are rent, rent payments and business rates. Um, this is a big issue, especially for culture and economy. Um, and then finally, the point about digital that has been made before, that there is this incredible pivot um, from cultural organisations to move content online. That has revealed digital skills shortages within the sector. Um, and also, it doesn't replace the live experience. You know, watching a play online is brilliant, but it doesn't replace the human connection of being in a theatre or watching a concert in that collective human endeavour. Um, it's that kind of visceral, connected experience. I, I think that can't be replaced by digital. Um, you know, we all stream our music a lot, but we still want to see bands in, in concerts. 
Um, so I would say they're the kind of big highlights from London right now. Thank you very much, Justine. This has been a terrific synthesis that also gives us uh, an incredibly useful roadmap in terms then of uh, policy measures. And now I would really, I'm really pleased to give the floor to Philip Kern that has a lifetime experience in the culture and creative industries. And uh, I'm very curious to hear what are uh, his perception in terms of the medium and long-term impacts of the crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Luigi. I would like to start by thanking the OECD and ECBN for this initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's a great moment to share amongst us, and probably most of us are some, some, some far, some, somewhere or the other involved in the cultural world. Uh, half of the population of this earth is uh, locked down, is suffering from a sanitary crisis, and maybe this is the time to reflect on the impacts of this crisis and how as cultural world we can contribute to the to the next step and to the to maybe a different world so i i propose to do to examine in order not to repeat what has been said uh, brilliantly before by the other speakers to maybe concentrate on the impact uh, of the crisis on uh, from a cultural policy point of view and uh, in this respect, I would like to, to see the, the, the slide on the, on, on, the, uh, on the computer, if possible. You know, we, we launched, uh, I think two weeks ago now, a kind of uh, crowdsourcing map in order to get everybody to participate in gathering data and information. So at this stage, I don't want very rapidly to give an update on where we are because we gathered uh, information of policy measures in 30 countries, 10 regions and six cities. Uh, they are all, they're covering public measures, but also looking into private measures that have been taken from foundations or initiatives from the business itself. Um, and uh, what come out of this uh, crowd, uh, of this collaborative map, is that uh, most of the measures are, are focusing on performing arts, visual arts, audiovisual film and music. Uh, and uh, and uh, what is also interesting in, in my view from uh, having examined uh, policy, uh, cultural policy for many years, is that I found uh, first that, this, that many, many, many states have been very supportive and active in developing measures to support the sector. Uh, so recognizing the importance of the sector economically and culturally. So this is good news in terms of visibility of the sector from a policy point of view. The second aspect I'd like to highlight is that uh, a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations from the cultural and creative sector, uh, have, are now also compiling information. So for me, it's an uh, indication that the sector is getting better organized uh, uh, in terms of uh, collecting data and making aware of uh, to policymakers on the part of the sector. So I just want to mention uh, Impala, the independent uh, music producers, Jazz Act, the Collecting Societies of Music, the Audiovisual Observatory, the Compendium of Cultural Policies, Cultural Funding Watch, uh, On The Move, uh, UNIC, are those organizations that are currently collecting data. And I think the indication that the sector is mobilized and making the best efforts to, to share practice and good practice uh, uh, around, the, around the globe. The second point I wanted to highlight in, my, in, in, in uh, assessing the impacts on cultural policy is independently of, of uh, policymakers recognizing the economic impact, uh, we have yet to see a recognition from policymakers on how the cultural scene and how artists can actually contribute uh, to the next steps, to the exit uh, of the crisis. And, um, we would like, or I would like to highlight that uh, the skills and the competence, the expertise, the experience of our sector is, is probably crucial and, uh, and, and co currently underestimated by policymakers on how we can contribute. So we are we are actually uh, trying to to highlight that uh, with a view to mobilize uh, the population, uh, we need to ensure that in the future, you know. A lot of countries are setting up prospective committees or committees planning for the future. That we don't not only look the future from a scientific and technical point of view, a bureaucratic point of view, but also from a cultural point of view and an artistic point of view. 
because we will need creation, we will need imagination to invent the next uh, uh, step. Because the objective is about uh, changing behaviors, uh, not only in terms of social distanciation, but also uh, changing our behaviors in terms of uh, consuming goods or services uh, in regard to uh, safeguarding the planets and nature, but also it may be in preserving biodiversity or preserving cultural diversity. Uh, and then also in a VA, you know, we, we, we recognize that uh, we are all in there for, for the same cause. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have to address uh, cultural prejudices. We have to avoid things that prevent solidarity to be built throughout the world with a view to fight uh, today a sanitary crisis, tomorrow uh, climate changes. And for me, uh, the cultural world and artists uh, can in two ways uh, uh, help in this fight. Uh, first, by, by enabling to make a kind of good diagnosis of the problems and, and, and have a, a critical eye, a disruptive eye on what has happened in society uh, over the years. They are the specialists in building empathy. They are the specialists in building social cohesion, in building participatory activities in uh, addressing the intercultural dialogue that we need today, in creating trust for citizens to indeed feel empowered to uh, maybe change things. And then the second uh, competence and skill they have is their ability to mobilize, to inspire, to set up uh, uh, tools for collaboration and cooperation. And, and therefore, I think it's important to uh, to mobilize uh, the cultural world and the artists so that they participate to the exit uh, uh, strategy. Obviously, the, this will be not enough and the regulator will have a, a, an important part to play and the regulator will have to uh, think about how to um, support you know, qualitative productions over, over quantity, so quality over quantity from an environmental point of view. Uh, develop uh, uh, digital offers that are respectuous of uh, cultural diversity and that are respectuous of supporting cultural coexistences. Also, uh, responsible social media. Uh, it will have also, the regulator will have to encourage and support uh, ethical behaviors and organizations that work collectively uh, uh, as opposed to organizations that are organized as monopolies or, or on, on the basis of, of greed. So in conclusion of my, of my intervention, uh, I would like uh, also to alert that there is a risk today, why there has been recognition of the economic impact and in many countries, there has been measures taken urgent, uh, urgent measures specific for the cultural sector. I can see now a trend where the cultural and creative sector is marginalized in relation to being not something of necessity. And, uh, and we have to be careful there and, and, and be able to show collectively that actually the activities are essential and they cannot be put aside or decide a later stage because it is viewed as, as non-essential. Uh, and we have to make strongly the case and highlight how much artists, cultural workers, cultural institutions uh, can contribute to a better world because of their specific expertise and, and skills. So I'd like to stop here my, my intervention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Philip. I think that uh, in your uh, very broad and thoughtful presentation, it deserves to be stressed, especially the last point, the so-called irrele irrelevance of culture when it comes to the really hard policy decisions. There is still in our policymakers outside the cultural sphere, this conviction that in the end, culture does not really matter. And I think that in a situation like this, there couldn't be a more striking evidence to the contrary. So it's extremely important, I think, that we streamline to the policymakers a very strong message in this regard. And the evidence that we have also in terms of the, of the mental health conditions of people and how culture, we are collecting in some sense also anecdotic evidence and probably more systematic evidence is needed to really understand what is the relationship between social cohesion and mental health today and the, the keeping together the social fabric in, of society in a stressful moment like this and the role that culture really has in all this. So thank you so much for striking this. And now we have a, a very 
uh, interesting and stimulating view from down under. We have from Adelaide, Justina Jokin, who give us uh, the perspective of the Adelaide Festival. Justina, floor is, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pierre Luigi, and thank you for the opportunity to make a contribution to this webinar today. Uh, festivals Adelaide is a peak body organization for Adelaide's 11 major festivals. And we certainly advocate for the recognition of festivals as delivering sizable local, national, and international benefit and being significant contributors to the growth and creation of so social connection that you speak of and the support for mental and physical well-being. In Australia, the festival sectors was understandably among the first to be affected um, with hundreds of events cancelled or postponed following the necessary bans of mass gatherings, which were of course followed by uh, more stringent restrictions. And we anticipate festivals to make a comeback in our calendars around September or October, uh, and that's uh, an optimistic view. Uh, and that is because we are currently entering our winter period. So this is very concerning, especially uh, given the reasons that Bernd addressed in his presentation. It's, it's, it's certainly a pessimistic outlook. Uh, for context, the live performance industry is a, a two billion, uh, a, Australian dollar industry and ticket sales in Australia. It is part of a broader um, 112 billion arts contribution to the economy. 80% of Australians attend arts events, 40% uh, of international tourists attend arts events. So the, the double blow of tourism and events being um, put on hold is, is being felt throughout. Uh, there are of course, um, over 600,000 Australians employed in the creative and cultural sector. As a response to the pandemic, a, a survey was launched called ilostmygig.com.au. It is a model uh, that was adopted uh, and replicated from Austin. Uh, it was launched to track the immediate losses of the creative and live performance industries. And to date, the site has had over uh, 12,000 submissions reporting a loss of income among artists of uh, 330 million, uh, and that is just for those canceled events uh, uh, immediately after the pandemic. Uh, in 2018, it was estimated that Adelaide's festival made a contribution of $110 uh, million dollars and uh, 1,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, of course, festivals have extensive infrastructure requirements uh, from stages, tents, catering, uh, so this flow on effect that Justine spoke of uh, is, is going to be absolutely uh, a, a big one. And the cancellation of these major events will affect the opportunities to hire other businesses to help organize festivals, therefore resulting in a severe loss of employment, uh, the creation and sale of products and services, and the purchase of intermediate out, uh, inputs. Uh, similarly, uh, festival patrons who often pay for foods and beverages, goods and transport and uh, admission for ticketed events will not have uh, the similar capacity to do so. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, cash sponsorship, which will be frozen until further notice. It is unlikely that some festivals will meet sponsored targets. Uh, this will result in needing to adjust programming ambitions limiting capacity to hire more staff as intended uh, in subsequent years and decreasing investment in innovation and development. Uh, relationships between donors, sponsors, and festivals will uh, undoubtedly be affected uh, for a long time. Uh, many festivals are intensely undertaking measures to identify new digital models that they could adopt while navigating many unknowns. Uh, a key priority is to support artists in generating income from their online content, uh, uh, a priority that was already spoken about, uh, but we're looking to see how we can leverage festivals as coordinated platforms uh, for this very purpose. Uh, this raises the opportunity for short-term digital intervention, uh, but also raises the question about the legacy of digital innovation in this space. Um, and, and this poses a really interesting challenge uh, to festivals about the uh, ephemerality of their seasons and the longevity of the works that they produce. Uh, for example, we're seeing festivals consider how to package festival arts content uh, that has been already captured in audiovisual format uh, so that it can be aligned with national curriculum uh, and so that children and youth can benefit from unique uh, educational materials uh, that give not only these performances more longevity, uh, but also um, supplement uh, 
the curriculum and educational materials that, that youth and children have access to. Uh, so festival cities around the globe will be addressing the various vulnerabilities uh, of the sector in their respective ways. Uh, but that said, from my discussions with uh, partners and, and colleagues in the sector, uh, I've been noticing that there are six overlapping priorities moving forward for festivals. Uh, and this includes identifying R&D initiatives, uh, boosting professional development opportunities among uh, staff, uh, amplifying uh, investment in entrepreneurial skills and capacity, especially in areas of funding diversification, sponsorship and fundraising, uh, incentivizing innovations, especially ones that require collaboration between other priority growth areas like agribusiness, international education, tourism, health and well-being. Uh, the fifth would be increasing accessibility to tech and digital solutions, uh, because as Pierre Luigi outlined uh, in his presentation, there is large discrepancy in this area, especially between cities and regions. That's something that we feel very strongly uh, here in Australia. Uh, and so we're considering how these digital solutions will be extensions and enhance enhancements of the festival experience. Uh, and, and lastly, a key priority is and question is how to leverage our international networks and cooperate in effective and practical ways uh, because the festival sector is a global circuit that relies on mobility partnerships and more platforms for artists to be able to get their work across to new audiences and to make an income from it and so we really have to support each other in in this rebuilding and recovery process so that uh, we have more options available and so uh, just to close, while uh, relief packages introduced today in Australia will aid the sector during the closure period, uh, to build resilience in the festival sector, um, it, it really will be tested in how well it uses the res resources it has or can obtain from collaboration. Uh, and as we begin to think about recovery in a world beyond this pandemic, uh, many are considering what pillars will support nations and societies in this process. Uh, there are many cities and uh, around the globe that are setting up a response and recovery councils. Uh, for me personally, it is um, concerning that the arts and creative industries are not re represented in these councils uh, more broadly. And we feel that festivals, um, it, you know, it's not really about uh, just having a seat at that table, but we feel that festivals are the table around which connections are made in the creative industries. Uh, and we are, we are the thread that combines them. Uh, so we hope festivals will, will continue to be the beating heart of this practice of reimagination and reconstruction. Uh, and thus we'll be working very closely with government to ensure that we can innovate in this area of policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justina. This was um, a very, very comprehensive and inspiring uh, uh, presentation. And you're right, I mean, festivals are really in some sense a nervous system of the creative ecosystem. And uh, it's uh, so important to preserve their vitality. And this really poses a challenge. I think that from this uh, first panel, we had a pretty clear and dramatically clear picture. The disruption is there. It's uh, clearly by far the, the biggest disruption we have ever faced. And this really calls for an unprecedented innovation effort. And uh, not simply in terms of uh, innovating actions, but also in terms of innovating policies. Because this also clearly has to do with uh, moving up to the, in the agenda the, the, the cultural priorities because really disrupting culture here could have uh, effects that the policymakers in their general mindsets are not really perceiving in their ultimate implications. So at this point we are ready for the second round that it focuses exactly on this point, uh, the emerging innovations, the game changers. So what will, uh, will, what will be the possible solutions to be explored. Clearly, we are just at the beginning of the crisis and it's very difficult to give definite answers, but we have here very qualified panelists from which we are really eager to hear. And I'm very glad to introduce Hassan Bakshi from Nesta, which is one of the you know, social innovation powerhouses in the world. So we're absolutely keen to hear what he has to say to us. Hassan. Thank you, Pierre Luigi. Um, can I just check that you can hear me because I I had an internet connection breakdown the moment the webinar started, so I'm joining by phone. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Terrific. And apologies to everyone in advance that I'm uh, hidden behind a phone, hidden behind a phone this afternoon. But uh, f thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to participate and, and for the excellent comments uh, that have been made in the first session. Um, I'm actually going to be fairly brief. Um, 
I wanted to start just by acknowledging the, a point that's been implicit really behind all the comments so far, which is that the uncertainties facing the creative industries at this time are, are, un, are unprecedented and huge. There's a lot we don't know. Uh, uh, the socio-cultural, economic, political, regulatory and technological environment within which the creative industries operate will be disrupted for at least the next year or two and quite possibly, if not probably, forever. And this uncertainty will also create a great deal of noise for creative businesses who will necessarily have to navigate this uncertainty through experimentation with changes to their operating models. So I'm going to focus my comment on innovation. In the early stages of this crisis, we have already seen across the world those parts of the creative sector most exposed to social distancing and lockdown. These are venue-based organizations like theater, museums, festivals, reacting where they are able with speed and agility. Each day we see more examples of theaters streaming productions from their back catalogs, museums pushing out their collections online, festivals migrating to digital programming, and independent bookshops turning to e-commerce. Many, if not most of these efforts are frugal. One example in the UK I wanted to share, and I particularly like, is the Coronavirus Theatre Club. And this is a club in where three actors, obviously out of work because of lockdown, have very quickly started an online platform for writers, directors and actors. And every Sunday evening, I encourage you all to sort of uh, join up, every Sunday evening the Coronavirus Theatre Club streams five monologues on a Twitter account, after which the productions are now available to view on YouTube. And the founders are connecting through this venture, writers with actors and directors, and thereby putting together new creative teams. Anecdotally, audiences have been quick to follow initiatives like these, and there are many examples worldwide. In the case of the Coronavirus Theatre Club, the venture has clocked up uh, almost 5,000 followers on Twitter without even having a website. But while perhaps we should not be surprised to see such examples of experimentation, of creativity, coming from the creative sector, whether they can be sustained financially is, of course, an altogether different question. And as competition for audience attention explodes, as venue-based culture competes more directly than ever before with consumption in the home, much, of course, which is free, the chances that the new initiatives can monetize their efforts are, alas, slim. And this is, of course, the long-standing long uh, long -standing challenge of business model innovation for creative businesses in the digital age. But that challenge has certainly in the near term, and quite likely forever, become an existential one. In England, the evidence from Nesta's Digital Culture Longitudinal Survey of Cultural Organisations, which we conducted prior to the COVID-19 crisis, is that only 22% of organisations report that digital technologies have a major impact on their revenues. So I wanted to uh, sort of get into the closing section of my comments with the observation that other parts of the creative ecosystem, most obviously the global internet platforms, the video games industry, appear to be thriving in this crisis. The million dollar question is how can the huge amounts of value added thereby generated in some parts of the sector be fairly invested back into those parts of the creative ecosystem that is less resilient but nonetheless critical for its variety, vitality, and overall survival. This includes the artists, the freelancers, the entrepreneurs, such as those that have set up the Coronavirus Theatre Club. And it raises a host of issues for public policy and for funding priorities that uh, obviously we can pick up in the policy session. But just to give some examples, most obvious examples, arts funding, research and development in particular, we all know that the existing definitions of research and development, of course, that are standardized at the OECD in the form of the Prestati Manual, are steeped in traditions of science and technology understandings of what innovation is. So the question is, is you know, th th this is sort of a, up until maybe a theoretical discussion about the way that R&D is defined uh, and that policymakers use to incentivize investment in innovation has now become a critically urgent issue. And so that's one obvious area, R&D funding. Another obvious area is copyright, uh, I'm, I'm quite nervous about relaxing copyright restrictions through legal mechanisms because this may undermine business models for many businesses just at the moment when they need support. But lots can be done by rights holders themselves. If you look at what Scribbit has done, for example, in making its library of reading material free for a month, Microsoft has increased access to Minecraft education, which is a young person's initiative. We should also think of more radical options 
including whether the government can license cultural content from creators on the behalf of the public, both as a support mechanism for creative businesses, but also the support for households as we all struggle to cope with our changed living circumstances. Another area is education. Much has been said about the importance of boosting ed tech, ed education technology in lockdown as the classroom has migrated to homes. I'm sure I'm not the only one on this uh, webinar who's trying to create a homeschooling environments for my kids with, with no notice. And children's learning, of course, by necessity in lockdown is being mediated wholly digitally. We need to boost the use of creative ed tech as well, creative education technologies. And there is a huge opportunity for sectors like the video games industry to lead the way in partnering with governments and schools. The last point is that the focus to date has naturally and rightly been in policy on jobs and keeping people at home. We have seen schemes to subsidize employment costs and grants for freelancers and the creative industries like other sectors, as Justine mentioned in her example earlier for the UK, are benefiting. But if there's one thing we've learned from all the research on mapping the creative industries in recent years, it's the importance of the ecosystem. For example, knowledge exchange between universities and businesses, networking infrastructures, someone alluded to the importance of craft and making activities, attending to the challenges in these parts of the ecosystem may turn out to be as important as other more obvious areas for policy. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Pierluigi. Thank you, Hassan. This was really terrific. I think that uh, the main takeaway and a big one is really the necessity to think in ecosystemic way in an ecosystemic way systematically. It's not simply a problem of policy, it's also a problem now of business development. And in particular, the fact, as you said, that uh, there are of course parts of the creative industry that are thriving in the current situation and how it's important to redistribute the benefits for the global sustainability because of course, there is a, a clear interconnection also in terms of the productive production structures between the thriving sector and the striving sectors. This is particularly important. And uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, especially the fact that the gamification is going to have a very, very strong impact in this heavily digitalized new situation. And uh, as you mentioned, I mean, the fact that even game environments like Minecraft could become educational venues in the new scenario and how this really entails a big push in terms of changing, restructuring our own mentalities as players in the culture and creative sectors, this is really extremely valuable. So thank you so much for your uh, insightful comments. And I would like uh, now to give the floor to Joana Gomes Cardoso from, Cardoso from, uh, from Lisbon. And Portugal is in this moment one of the most uh, vibrant uh, countries in Europe in terms of uh, culture and creative development. So we are particularly keen to hear from her. Joana. Hello, thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation to, to be here and thank you for organizing this uh, webinar because it's more important than ever that we exchange experiences. And thank you for your kind words about um, our ecosystem, which has indeed been very vibrant lately, but as all of us, uh, our theaters, museums, art galleries, they've now been closed for just over one month. So um, we are also in the process of collect collecting data, of making the case for the cultural sector. We are exactly in that stage as well. So again, it's very helpful to hear and to understand what is being done um, in other cities. Um, as far as digital platforms are concerned, um, it's not something we were strong at. That was the first, let's say the first, um, uh, comment was was when we realized like all everyone we were caught by surprise by this and indeed we, it wasn't something we had been investing on very strongly um, and yet over the past month they've been essentially our only way of engaging with the public so of course they've been very very um, they've been key they've been very important to engage with the public and also to allow to pay some artists with whom we are already engaging in um, these platforms but I would argue, of course, that they have limitations. Some have already been mentioned. We don't want people to think that seeing a play online and seeing a play on stage is the same thing. We, we certainly don't want to lose the physical and the communal experience of uh, 
um, interacting with, with art. So we are seeing them um, as a complement to what we are trying to do at the moment, not as a global solution. We are being careful not to overuse it. Now, of course, artists were the first to spontaneously and generously put themselves out there with free contents. And now it's tricky to reverse that and uh, to find ways to make them pay contact content, even if it is in their benefit. Um, so all this raises a lot of questions that I think collectively we need to look at with the artists. But I think in this one month, uh, our experience has already shown two things. As I mentioned, we weren't really very strong in this area. And within this last month, a series of very creative initiatives um, happened. Uh, uh, so it triggered very original contents, um, which probably in normal conditions would not have happened. And not just digital, our poetry house, for example, has set up a program of phoning, ringing up uh, people and reciting poetry. And this is very interesting because going back also to the exclusion point Justine made, it enables us to reach, for instance, an older generation, which as we know is being particularly targeted by this crisis and who is not necessarily digital. So um, it's, it's created a lot of creativity and perhaps even more interesting, I think, it's, it's definitely allowed us to engage uh, or increase our level of interaction with our public through new activities and proposals that we are sending, putting out there. But also it seems to have allowed us to reach out. We seem to be broadening publics, perhaps because indeed the digital platforms, uh, let's say, are perhaps less intimidating to certain parts of the public than um, you know, the idea of coming to a theater, a museum, an art gallery. So I think one of the key uh, challenge is going to be how to keep all this public, the one we had and the new one interested and engaged, and most of all, how to then have them come physically to our spaces. Because again, we don't want to keep them just on the virtual level. We would like them to transition once it is possible for them to come and to have the physical, the communal experience. Um, but I think that, I think Philippe mentioned this earlier, I think it will be artists who will be very much guiding us here and who will be helping us give, give us the solutions, be it the virtual, be it the physical. Uh, we already know that the physical will also not be the same whenever it does happen. So I think we need to, and this is perhaps, we'll be discussing this later on, we really need to focus now on how to help the artists, the technicians. Again, technicians are, not, are very often not, um, um, involved within the, the digital. The digital has the, the perverse side, if you like, that we can do very easily homemade things, but there's a whole entire sector of technician that lose out on that. So I think with artists, and we need to now in, in find ways of uh, helping the people who make this sector of different levels survive, so that we can then with them find ways of uh, engaging, being in a virtual way, which will certainly continue after this and will, we've already seen, allow us to reach certain publics, such as elder people, such as children, uh, who we know already will probably take longer for us to be able to engage with in the traditional way, and also to find, uh, to help us find ways to engage with public once we are able to reopen our spaces, which is our ultimate goal. Thank you very much, Joanna. And this uh, really brings us uh, completely into the third and crucial round uh, of thought, uh, which is clearly policy. So we have to act and we have to act fast. So it's uh, only natural and it's really my pleasure to give the floor now to Gianpaolo Manzella, the Under Secretary of State for the Italian Ministry of Economic Development. Gianpaolo. Hello. Hello. Ciao, Pippa. Um, thank you for having me here. I bring you the perspective of uh, a country which was the first one in Europe to be hit by the virus. A country whose soft power is very much linked to cultural activities and cultural goods. A country where the combination of uh, uh, culture and tourism has got a very strong dimension in terms of economic activity. We are Thinking, we are speaking about between 14 and 18 percent of the GDP 
um, stemming from uh, culture and uh, tourism. Uh, what was the reaction that the country, the government gave to this? Mm, I think that we can, uh, uh, the, the problems are the ones that have been highlighted, we can differentiate between general measures and measures specifically uh, linked to cultural activities. Uh, as to the general measures, uh, the OECD has been carrying a study about how governments have been reacting to COVID in economics, and basically the three aspects have been injections of liquidity, deferral of payments, and uh, uh, funds, indemnity funds as redundancies, as redundancy funds. And these three aspects have been uh, applicable to uh, people. So, uh, under this standpoint, uh, people working in the cultural sector has, have, has been um, uh, considered as people uh, working in any other sector or any other economic sector. On top of that, due to the efforts of the Ministry of Culture, we have some aspects which uh, characterize the cultural uh, activities. A special fund about uh, about uh, uh, cultural activities. Uh, um, Pierluigi spoke about this before. Uh, a, a portion of the rights of the copyrights uh, of the Italian company gathering copyrights is uh, given to support of artists and not as before to the support of activities of young artists, but to support of living expenditures. There has been a program of reimbursement of tickets. And finally, which I think is very interesting, in the lockdown of economic activities, an exemption was granted to um, libraries, to uh, books, books, uh, bookshops. So while a lot of activities are, are a lot of commercial activities are closed as a symbol. The, the idea was uh, put to have libraries, uh, bookshops open. In addition to that, a lot of regions have been carrying out activities in always in the same line: liquidity, uh, indemnities, and deferral of, of payments. What has been the reaction of creative uh, people? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's a time of experimentation. A lot of examples have been uh, carried out before. Azan spoke about this COVID uh, uh, club uh, just before. There have been a number of initiatives, both of creatives, uh, creative people, both of cultural institutions that have been uh, keeping on the, on the uh, newspapers, in the society, the idea of the importance of uh, of, uh, of, of culture. And I think that this element of experimentalism, it's a very interesting element that we have to treasure about that. Because we often hear about experimentalism in scientific or technological aspects, simply because there are reconversion of productions that provide us with the goods that we need for the lockdown, but the experiment, ex experimentalism that we are facing on, uh, on, on the creative side uh, is as much as important. What next? Uh, well, first of all, in, in my view, we have to maintain the, the measures taken. There have, there have been a lot of indications from uh, advisory groups uh, the establishment of a stronger fund, fund for culture, the need for a very strong communication policy, a very strong communication policy that reminds the importance of, of culture. Data, uh, Justin already highlighted the importance of, uh, of data. Uh, I think it's a question that is arising in Italy as well. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the need for uh, correct numbers is very much felt. 
um, I think we are uh, we are asking to uh, for the European uh, programs to be stronger and bolder in in uh, in some ways. We are asking to have people in the creative sector participate in the task forces groups that are working on uh, the future uh, of uh, Italian politics. And I think that Philip Kern uh, touched on this issue in a very complete way. So I, I think it's something that uh, should really be taken into account uh, because uh, as he said, uh, creative people bring a different perspective and now what we need is a different uh, per perspective. What, what do we need uh, in, the, in, the, in the longer term? Something that struck me uh, in, in a recent book by Frank Snowden, Snowden which is, who is uh, an historian of Yale University, who is probably one of the most important um, scholars in pandemics uh, in the world. And he said that ep epidemics are a category of disease that seem to hold up the mirror to human beings as to who we really are. And what is showing this mirror on creative industries? Well, I think the first thing that it shows is the importance of the sector. Uh, the importance of the sector for, co for community values. The second is the uh, fragilities of the sector. We have already taken into account the fragility of people working in the sector, very often with uh, um, autonomous jobs, uh, very often with uh, precarious uh, jobs, and not with a steady occupation. Secondly, the, the institutional fragility uh, surrounding, if you want, the creative industries. The fact that creative and cultural people is not co considered when, when setting up a task force reminds us that the fact that the trip to the center of the policy making scene has got yet to be uh, completed. Therefore, what I think is uh, that we need, uh, at least in Italy, where we don't have a national strategy for creative industries, to really have a national, uh, a national strategy uh, for that with data, with specialized bodies, because we have to, we need specialized bodies to better understand the changes that uh, that this sector is undergoing. Um, we need schemes for for contribution to companies working on the digital and helping traditional cultural and institutions to offer their service in a different in a different way. Uh, we need to strengthen evidently the digital access. And we need to uh, work on research and development because really the research and development uh, time is ahead of us because all the challenges this sector has got. Last thing on the uh, European uh, scene, uh, the political, the, poli the, the last um, industrial policy document speaks about ecosystems of innovation. I think we have to work for ecosystems of creativity. This virus has given us, has got a strange element of culture because even though every one of us is close in his, in his or her own lockdown, we all feel that we are really participating in a really broader picture. This is a paradox if you want, but never, as, as in, this, as this, in this moment, the, the individual dimension of the, of the single is incredibly connected with a global, a global dimension. And uh, I think that our role is really to uh, highlight this element and to say and to convince people that together with a health emergency, together with an economic emergency, there is also a cultural emergency in the world today and that we have really to battle it now because uh, at stake is the risk of change of demand and if, it, if the demand changes, really 
the, the, the revolution of the offer will be very, very, very profound. Thank you very much, Gianpaolo, and uh, we really hope that the Italian government will also lead the way also in this uh, very big and uh, ambitious innovation agenda. We really need it as a country, but also as Europe, of course. And speaking of Europe, I'm now particularly keen to give the floor to my former colleague, Barbara Stacher from the European Commission, because clearly the European Commission has a big role in uh, leading the way again for future strategic option in terms of policy responses to the crisis. Barbara. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for having organized this wonderful conference. I can see that uh, we have 840 participants. I've been trying to read uh, all these interesting questions. Uh, it's actually really interesting to have uh, all all these people from everywhere on, in the world on board, so really congratulations. Now, uh, concerning what the EU is doing, well, this uh, COVID crisis is of course major concern for, it's a major concern for the EU. Uh, concerning cultural and creative sectors, what can be mentioned is, uh, well, the, really, the temporary framework for state aids, basically uh, so that member states can help uh, some of the sectors. Then there were 37 billion euro released for the Corona Investment Initiative. It's basically to make use of uh, structural funds, which are uh, where there's still some money available. And then 100 billion euro have been released for unemployment support. Now, as has been said already by, uh, um, by people before me in that conference, it is clear that all these measures are not only sector specific, they're not only for cultural and creative sectors, so which is why I think it is really very important what you have been saying before, that uh, activities like exactly this one, we need to have more of them, we need to, to, to work together to do advocating, uh, basically coming back to, to what was said before, everybody in confinement is turning to culture because uh you know it, it, it because of its intrinsic value and to help us through these uh, difficult situations each one of us had its first uh, uh, death uh, and, and ill people so basically uh, if culture were not there it would really be difficult uh, so i think that's definitely one of the most important things to keep it up on the agenda and to argue for that then I would also like to highlight uh, the COVID hackathon on, at the EU level. The European Commission has been uh, calling to, to, uh, to different maker spaces or uh, creators to help us to um, kind of hack, hack the crisis. There have been amazing things going on already with uh, Fab Labs producing uh, you know, masks uh, and 3D printing, all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, devices to help us uh, against COVID. So that's of course very well appreciated. And also on the cultural side, of course, I mean, all these uh, streamings that is ongoing to help us. Of course, the main issue remains here that has been also addressed before, how to turn all this for free culture basically into revenues for the people who are producing that. So that's basically one of, uh, of the main issues here. So what can be said is on data now, because um, Pierluigi has been mentioning two things which are, I think, also very important. Yes, to continue to, um, to make our cases uh, with data and also culture and well-being to prove basically uh, how important culture is in that, uh, in that sense. There are ongoing studies, so, well, not ongoing, but there will be studies who, uh, which are going to start. One is on culture and well-being. Uh, and then there's also different studies which are, which are going to be launched, also with the European Parliament, uh, on, on data, basically, quantifying COVID on cultural and creative sectors in order to better make uh, cases. So, uh, thank you. I, I think, will we have the possibility also to have something, um, you know, concerning answering questions and uh, something interactive? 
Oh, there, there will be probably a final section of Q&A depending on how long the session uh, lasts, of course. But uh, so if, if there are, uh, of course, further questions, Barbara, we will rely on you because, okay. of course, there is lots of curiosity about uh, the Commission and what will um, be the next moves. And uh, yeah, and I think we should also emphasize that the Commission has a, an important instrument like the new European Agenda for Culture that gives a very clear perspective in terms of an impact perspective for culture and uh, we, we, we hope that this will inform at least in part the future moves of the Commission in terms of tackling the crisis. And then of course, uh, needless to say, there are the programs which have been there before, Creative Europe, uh, trying to, uh, to find also answers to the crisis. Then there are other programs uh, like uh, cultural uh, and innovation communities, Kicks for CCIs and Horizon program. So all of those programs basically are now feverishly looking at how can they incorporate, uh, how can they help with COVID. So, but that's a, too early basically to be talking about concrete uh, steps here. Thank you very much, Barbara. And now I would like to give back the floor to Justine Simons to hear about the policy perspective from her vantage point. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, what I thought I'd do is um, I gave those kind of nine themes at the start. And what I'll try to do very quickly is just to provide some um, animation onto those themes and to share what kind of particular policies are emerging. Um, so what we've been doing is tracking the policy responses from our world cities every week. And we've got a rolling kind of status update of everything that everyone is doing because there's just so much happening. But what we've started to do is group them into themes. So what we're finding is that uh, there's five groups of policy that is, are really the kind of top five groups. One is the financial relief packages. Two is the advocacy and lobbying packages. Three, communications and information that cities are doing. Four, job retention and creation and five, uh, reform in recovery. Um, so people starting to talk about this idea of a just transition, transition that improves the lives and the equality in the system. Um, so just to give a bit of a kind of flavor to, uh, a bit of, put, put a bit of flavor to that, um, one of the things that we're seeing is the suspension of targets. So lots of cities are suspending targets, but maintaining grants. So um, in, in the UK, in Amsterdam, in Helsinki, providing that security for institutions, but releasing them from their delivery responsibilities. They obviously can't put theatre shows on right now, but we want the theatres to survive. So suspension of targets, it's happening a lot. Um, I've mentioned this already, but the second is connecting to the most vulnerable in the workforce. Lots of global cities raising questions about how they can feel confident that their funding is going to the people who really need it, to the individuals. So for example, in the UK, the Arts Council has suspended targets and, and um, confirmed grants, but on the condition that those arts organizations continue to honor the agreements with artists. So they've built it into the rescue package. Sao Paulo, they're looking at the direct employment of creative workers. So the Secretary for Culture has this program of hiring freelance and self-employed professionals to generate online content, being led by the city of Sao Paulo. In Singapore, for example, uh, there's a program which is payment to train. So um, it's arts funding for self-employed people to attend training programs to try and build capacity in the sector and given an income. And then more broadly, as I said before, how can the power balance in the system be more equitable in the future? Uh, number three, I talked about this too, advocacy around the world. There's so much happening. Um, I don't think we've got time to go into the detail, but I think broadly speaking, the task for city governments is synthesizing the evidence and making a compelling case. So um, my favorite phrase is uh, to change policy, you need a combination of data and jeopardy. So you need those really compelling data points and you need the jeopardy. What happens if we don't do this? And I think that is more important than ever right now, 
given everything that everyone's talked about, about how culture can be easily marginalised um, in our response. So getting a seat at the table and marshalling compelling arguments. Um, data gathering, I've mentioned Amsterdam, London, San Francisco, New York, everyone's really up to, you know, the lo large scale economic impact analysis um, on the city's arts and culture sector, which will be key in building the evidence to support recovery. So we're not gathering data for its own sake, because we're interested in that anyway, but we're interested also in synthesizing that data into our arguments and creating some policy change. Uh, number five, digital. Um, with all the caveats about paying artists and the fact that larger institutions are well placed to do this, a number of cities are pushing themselves from a city level around digital. So Buenos Aires has got hashtag culture and casa, France, culture chez nous, Helsinki is investing in more e-licenses for library services for books. Um, Brasilia has got a festival of graffiti at home. Nanjing museums and galleries are using platforms like TikTok to bring content to people in their homes. In the UK, the BBC is doing culture in quarantine. And just yesterday, I heard a very powerful statistic from the New York Met, which is when they stream their last online show, their usual online audience is about 100,000. And it was 2 million uh, this last week. So a really kind of big, kind of powerful statistic there to show the scale of it. Um, I've got a summary of financial packages from the cities, but I think as we're short of time, I'm not going to kind of reel the whole list off. Um, but they basically range from between 1 million and, and 20 million euros um, from Paris, Hong Kong, San Francisco, Seoul, Sydney, Singapore, Sao Paulo, Vienna, Barcelona, and many, many more um, doing various different subsidy emergency response schemes. And we're tracking all of those. I think the other thing I say on the financial side of it is philanthropy. Um, we're seeing also, especially in terms of a more strategic approach from some of the philanthropists. So, you know, our colleagues at Bloomberg Philanthropies have convened a wider group of uh, phil uh, philanthropic um, supporters in the States, and they have managed to put together a, a bigger pot of money, $95 million. And they are working with the city to, again, work out where is the most need, where's the most tactical and strategic work, where can they plug the, the gaps that government is leaving. So there's some interesting kind of strategic work, I think, emerging from between philanthropy and government. Um, and then seven, I mentioned this reform and recovery. So this phrase, a just transition. Um, what can we do in the future to reform the labor market, improve the power, uh, the power balance for artists? In the UK, we'd like to have better tax breaks for philanthropy, for example. Can we make an argument for that right now? Um, Climate change, inclusion, equity, you know, what can, how can we positively use this moment to push for just transition? And I think just to close, a few questions that are, are, are kind of arising for us. So uh, how can we shift the power balance and fix those systemic problems in the labour market to protect freelancers and the self-employed? Um, question, how can we place culture at the heart of our recovery strategies, economically and socially? Um, three, how can we use this as an opportunity to reposition culture, not just as an added extra, as a nice to have, but as a core value across society, across government, across policy? Um, and I think there's a sense that, you know, this will be a long road to recovery. Um, we're all focused on our emergency immediate response, um, but um, it's going to last a lot, lot longer. So we really want to also be starting to think about what happens next, what happens after the unlock, what happens after the immediate emergency push, which really is a kind of sticking plaster. It's not a long-term set of solutions. We've just rushed to the emergency response right now. Um, and then I just thought I'd share this with you. Someone just sent me this lovely quote um, by Aaron Dati Roy, who said, um, I just wanted to share it with you. It says, the pandemic, the pandemic is a portal. We can walk through it with our dead ideas, or we can walk lightly, ready to imagine another world. So I thought I'd share that with you as my close. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Justine is a wonderful wish, by the way, that uh, we should really try to make true. And uh, so, from the perspective from, uh, from London and from the Global Network, what is the perspective now from Liz, Joanna? Hello again. It's difficult to follow up Justine and Aaron that you wrote, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, 
I think as, as it's been said, it's very important to recognize that there are at least two different timings that require different policies. One, the current moment, the emergency, the urgency, how to um, help artists, technicians, freelancers, how to guarantee that they have a salary, a means of subsistence to survive the crisis, and then the medium long-term policies. Um, the first, going back to it, it um, again, it requires, in my perspective, a, an assistance. And cities have been doing this in different ways. Um, and I think it requires not just a city level response, but perhaps a regional one as well, meaning the EU indeed has to also come into action. And we are seeing a, a, a broader discussion uh, regarding EU sol solidarity um, in economic terms. And I think we should try to have it as well within the cultural sector. Now, here in Portugal, we have seen the creation of very different funds, um, national, local, public, private, and this is positive on one hand. And by the way, I'm answering Vanessa, who, who was asking me a question on q and I don't know who she is, but I'm replying to your question, I hope. The, the, the problem with some of these funds, is, or with all of them, let's say, is that they are not necessarily connected. They have come up spontaneously from different organizations, as I mentioned, some public, some private, etc. But they're not necessarily connecting. They're not necessarily uh, communicating with each other. Therefore, we will have perhaps a situation of du duplication, which I would actually argue is okay. But at worst, we will have a situation of exclusion, of, of, of uh, not covering everybody. Um, so, and as well, some are being conditioned, some of these fundings and help is being conditioned to the presentation of a project. Now, as we know, this is very tricky at this moment. It's very tricky to present anything that isn't virtual or that isn't digital. So um, it's, it's, it's tricky when the funds are attached, let's say, to the presentation of, of something. On the medium and long term front, I think we need to think of reopening as fast and as safely as we can, of course, our spaces so that we can resume our, our normal activity. I think that will be the best way to help in the medium long term. We're in Portugal have just uh, found out yesterday that uh, we may be in a position to reopen some of our spaces as early as June, which we weren't um, expecting. So we are going to have to start thinking very quickly. And as Justine said earlier, we need to get it right. We, we can't afford to get it wrong. Uh, lives are at stake. This could all be very fragile and could all reverse very quickly. So if we do want to have our spaces open, we need to be ready and the public needs to be ready as well that we, we are going to have to do it in different ways. Um, in Asia, as you know, uh, there are measures such as taking people's temperatures at the door, uh, people having to wash their hands, masks, limitations. So we're gonna have to be prepared to find new formats and, and, and to have conditions, let's say. But again, I think that artists can help us finding ways to um, uh, present plays, to have concerts that are as safe as possible. And the public, again, will have to be understanding. But again, to create a kind of a psychological as well dimension of confidence for them to come. Um, I'm, of course, speaking from a privileged background in the sense that um, I represent an organization that has uh, a, 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 an important dimension of public funding. But Lisbon, as you probably know, in the last couple of years especially, was uh, very dependent on tourism, which is now, and we don't know for how long, gone. So um, I think as a city, we need to rethink our economic and strategic policy. And as the cultural sector, we also need to rethink our rhythm, our timings, our scale. Uh, in the museum sphere, we've already heard a lot of times that you know the large blockbuster exhibitions are probably going to be on hold for a while. Um, I don't think we're, we're all doing futurology here. None of us know exactly what's going to happen, but I, I certainly think we are going to see a kind of a, a slower pace of things, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and as a last point, though, I would argue we have to be very careful about not losing our international dimension and all the international complicities that have been created through the different cultural spaces. Um, it's very natural and legitimate that our first response was to our sector, to our people, let's say. But it's very important with all the financial constraints that we can already anticipate that we keep 
a, an open, you know, we want our theaters, our museums, our, our art galleries to continue to be open spaces, to continue to engage with their partner the, abroad. This is, this is a global crisis. So the answers will somehow have to be global as well. And I think we, we need to find this um, global solidar um, outlook that will help us come out through this. And I think artists are also especially well placed to be able to help us policymakers do that. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, it's uh, really challenging. Eh? We, we, we really understand that this is going to revolutionize our way of thinking, working, and basically doing everything. And uh, well, <laughs> we'll see. Now it's interesting to hear from Ben Faisal, who from the point of view of the ECBN, which is one of the largest networks in Europe for culture and creative organization production, uh, for production, gives us, uh, I think, also a very, very interesting uh, perspective on policy, also because there is already a white paper that the ECBN is producing on this. Bernd. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the floor, Pierluigi. Um, the statements um, ECBN has put in the white paper also focus around the idea that we should not rebuild the old, but should rebuild the new and, um, and build the new. And many of my speakers uh, before me have been elaborating on this, that we have a new framework of the economy and society around us, and that we have also to innovate ourselves and our own value chains within. So um, I, um, I dare say I would not iterate this again, but maybe make a spontaneous reflection on our aims to rebuild the world. Currently, we are living in a strange form of crisis because of the vast funding uh, states have provided. Um, a lot of the sector is not really hit by the crisis yet. And we are talking now as if Europe is as rich as it was four weeks ago, but in fact, it is not. You know, when people are saying that we will have this, the biggest economic crisis after the Second World War, currently we don't see this, we don't live this. So maybe three months down the road when public funding will subside, we will really hit the bottom. And then we have to realize that uh, our economies, our governments uh, are not um, able to spend those funds. We are just poorer. And... Um, so given this situation, I think we have to realize also that our sector has to do something many sectors have done already. They are doing policy. They are part of policy. They're in parliament. You know, we are always talking to parliament people. But which famous artist, author, film producer is a member of parliament, which is from our sector? You know, but if you look for the car sector, for industry sectors, uh, for teachers, lawyers, they all have their people in parliament. So I think as this recovery will take a decade, we really have to also change our perspective as artists and makers of art and enablers. It is not just calling for funds, but really going in policy and making funds. So I think we as the cultural creative sector really have to be much more political, much more political. We have to be politicians ourselves to fix this. So that's my reflection. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernd. Very stimulating and provocative. And uh, to finish this panel, I will give back the floor to Philip Kern. So Philip, what are the takeaways that you heard from this discussion and what are your policy views? Thank you, Pierre Luigi. Uh, I'd like to build on what uh, what Bernd has been saying, I think indeed we, we can look at policymakers and ask them to support the, our activities, but I think it's time maybe for the cultural world, the artists, the designers, and because we are specialists in bottom-up approach to actually contribute and maybe help policymaking in the future. Um, I think we can mobilize, uh, or at least we should be mobilizing the designers and the artists and the cultural workers to this uh, to this effect. In uh, I think we have been showing over the years that culture can be mainstream in other policy areas, in social policy, in environmental policy, in economic policy, 
in uh, innovation policies. And maybe this is the time where it should be uh, a challenge to, to make concrete proposals in those different areas. So of course we are not prepared. We are prepared to do something else. We are prepared to do art. We are prepared to do entertainment. We are, but I think uh, there is a, maybe an opportunity here to call on the strengths and the competence and the skills of our sectors to, uh, to contribute and uh, influence. Uh, maybe more concretely now in terms of what has happened in the marketplace, we can clearly see that uh, streaming and digital is going to take uh, a, a big chunk in the future. So video streaming, uh, uh, music streaming and so on. And so maybe then there, there will be a need for uh, people working for cultural policies, ministries, cultures to shift maybe the emphasis on how can they support digital distribution. Uh, today, the policy funding is very much geared towards supporting production, local production. Now, in addition, we need to think about how can we support distribution, access to the audience online, and also how can we develop an offer in the here in terms of production that is attractive to the audience. Because today, it's easy to go to Netflix or Amazon because they have a big catalog. It's much more difficult to connect to uh, public broadcast, supplied broadcasters, or small VOD platforms because they don't have the catalogs and they don't have the, uh, the promotional muscles of those big uh, giants. So we need to reflect on how to make the streaming world a diverse, cultural diverse world. Also to avoid that content is only coming from one part of the world, but it's coming from throughout the world. Uh, because digital distribution gives us the opportunity to, to see things from Africa, from other side of Europe, from, from uh, Eastern Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, and so on. And so there, there, is, a, there is a need to create this the value of uh, 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 cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue. I think this is going to be important in the future. And this is linked also maybe to competition policy, how to ensure some kind of digital sovereignty, digital cultural sovereignty across the world and, and, uh, and, and, fly and, and fight uh, monopolies that are in a position to uh, maybe uh, uh, um, control uh, this new way of uh, distributing a culture or enjoying culture. Uh, so, and I would like to stay to, to, to finish here. I'd like to also to, to wish everybody uh, good health and, uh, and keep safe. Thank you very much, Philip. We very much, all of us, we need this. Uh, and so I'm asking Katia, are there any questions from, from our audience that we could pick? Well, Pierluigi, um, there was a lot of interest in uh, Justine's presentation on the nine themes and then the structured policy supports as well. And I think we can circulate uh, this also after the webinar. And uh, there were also signs from Creative uh, Saxony burned that, uh, well, of course, there are new uh, new data now for the study and uh, unfortunately it, doesn't, it looks even bleaker as well. And we, we will, of course, uh, circulate and share the updated version um, of this study. Uh, for the other questions uh, that were most uh, popular, and, and of course for, for Kia, for the collaborative map, we'll also include this uh, in, in the further communication so that people can access it and see it. Uh, uh, well, maybe one uh, question uh, which was already partly addressed by Joanna and uh, maybe some others, um, uh, how to boost the partnerships between tourism and culture to make a stronger and united front towards responses and recoveries. This is one of the most popular questions in the, in the chat. Who wants to answer to this question? Joanna, maybe? I can, I can try. Uh, how to boost? Well, as I said, we're now in the process of thinking how to recover, how to reconnect. And some of this uh, will be beyond us, let's say. I mean, we, our, our borders are still closed at the moment. So we first need to get out of this state of emergency to reopen borders. Um, perhaps the fact that Portugal, and I, I, I really hesitate to say this because we never know what's going to happen tomorrow, but so far the situation in Portugal has been somewhat uh, controlled and uh, we know that 
Um, there are people, even for example, people who have second homes here from northern countries who have preferred to, let's say, spend their quarantine period in sunny Portugal, so to say. Um, perhaps that we will retain some advantage, some edge there to be able to reconnect. Our tourism board actually did a really interesting campaign just two or three days after the whole situation emerged, which was stop. There, they did a video clip, a very nice video clip that you would look and think it would be your traditional promotion of the country, but it was actually about how don't travel, stop, take this time to, to, to just pause and then restart. And I think this is probably what we're going to see. We're probably going to see a, a slow, but hopefully consistent uh, way of, of people to start once again traveling. Specifically for the cultural sector, I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, if we are able to retain, in the sense, if our museums, our theaters, our art galleries, if, if they are able to retain the complicity that they've built over the years with their international counterparts and organizations such as this one help also uh, reinforce that at this moment, then I think, uh, again, we will probably have to change the way we were doing things. Perhaps we won't travel as much, perhaps we won't have as many uh, international physical international seminars perhaps these webinars will be part of the answer but I think indeed what, what is key is to remain not to close up not to 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 close up and so I see it from a perspective that is not just financial I mean we we run um, one of the the most visited museum uh, monument of the city and so we're very keen of course also from a financial point of view for tourists to to come back and to be able to visit it again and a large part of the revenues that then support the theaters and the museums come from those um, from from those visits so it's we, we certainly will do all we can once there are minimum conditions to reopen and for people to travel again to try to make sure that they feel safe again to visit these spaces but I see it in a broader perspective uh, of uh, keeping our minds open keeping ourselves very receptive and very open uh, in a perspective of solidarity if you like with other countries Thank you very much, Joana. And uh, Katia, are there um, any other questions? Well, I, I think uh, well, um, there are not so many questions that maybe we can answer now, but uh, as I was saying in the beginning, we can uh, collect them, uh, compile them, and uh, also ask our speakers to provide some written comments uh, over next week by next Friday. So maybe we can proceed in this way, given the time. Thank you very much. So at this point, since we have been uh, a bit beyond what was the program time, but of course, uh, I think this is also a signal of how vital and full of content the discussion was, I will now devote uh, really a couple of minutes, not more, to a final wrap-up of what emerged. Well, a, a wrap-up of what emerged is impossible because really we, we roam through so many different topics. So I, I think I would limit myself to a short lexicon, a few terms that emerged and popped up and uh, we're also going through several presentations that give us a sort of mental geography of what seems to be the, 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 the core of the debate at the moment. The first one is obviously digital. Clearly, we are experiencing a digital push much beyond what could have been expected before the actual crisis. Uh, nevertheless, of course, there were trends about the future of the digital, but this really puts it in a completely new perspective. The point is, is the cultural sector really, really ready for this big digital push? The answer that we had from our panelists is not so much. So surprisingly, of course, there are sectors that are heavily digital that thrive on this, but there are also other sectors that are not completely prepared. And this is not only a matter of sectors, it's also a matter of territories. So uh, one first aspect is we need a digital acceleration that is not simply a technological acceleration, but it's also an acceleration in terms of skills, in terms of capabilities and capacity to use this in creative ways. The second point, uh, the second word is probably relevance. Culture has not been relevant enough in this crisis. It's been uh, overlooked mostly. Uh, for example, in the Italian task force for uh, the rebooting of the country, there is no specialist coming from the cultural field in a country like Italy. And this of course uh, tells, a lot, lot, tells a lot. So then the point becomes how culture could make the difference. How could we 
face this opportunity because there is also an opportunity to make a really convincing case for the relevance of culture in terms of policy making. The third term is inclusion. Clearly, we have here a credibility test. In a moment like this, uh, the misperception, because it's mainly a misperception, that culture has been an elitarian form, something that has been discriminating people from uh, less, uh, let's say, affluent constituencies, this kind of misunderstanding, this kind of um, misperception is now or never. This is the moment in which culture can really show how it can contribute actively to laying bridges toward the excluded communities. And this is not simply in terms of immediate relief, but it's also in terms of active citizenship. And this is really, again, a lifetime opportunity. The fourth word is behavior. One thing that we have been disregarding is that culture is also a tremendous force of behavioral change. Culture has an enormous emotional impact of people. Culture has an enormous cognitive impact of people the way in which people change their ideas, form their ideas, how they react to situations has a lot to do with their cultural background and experiences. So if culture is a, such a powerful driver of behavioral change, especially in a moment in which the solution to the crisis is very much about changing behaviors, how can culture really contribute to this? How can we be more proactive in proposing culture as part of the solution? And this brings with us an, a fifth word, which is mobilization. As it was uh, mentioned by many of our panelists, culture has a lot to give in terms of the skills, the capacity of the artists, of the cultural, uh, of the cultural professionals. It's not simply relieving the professional at risk in terms of giving them support measures. It's also, of course, tapping into the potential of uh, cultural professionalism and cultural creativity in terms of finding creative solutions also beyond the cultural sector to issues that have to do with the new normal that we'll have to live with for the time being or at least for a long time. And then ecosystem, this has really popped up everywhere. It's probably now uh, the time to uh, stop thinking in terms of silos when we think of cultural sectors. Cultural sectors are heavily interconnected and this is extremely important today to find new sustainability strategies for culture as a whole. And so thinking in ecosystemic terms sounds very nice, but uh, transforming this into a real policy practice and policy design is much more challenging, but the time is now. The other uh, point that uh, came out uh, very often is mental health. So culture is really contributing to issues that have to do directly with the impact of the crisis, because the impact of the crisis is not simply people getting sick from the virus, it's people getting sick from isolation, it's people getting sick from fear, it's people so that really needs a substantial relief in terms of mental health, and the, the role of culture has been so apparent that now, again, this must become a powerful basis for a new integrative vision of public health where culture plays a role. And then innovation. Innovation is not just technological innovation here. It's really policy innovation. It's really social innovation. In some sense, we are facing probably the biggest innovation challenge from the times of the Great Depression. And if we learn what was the outcome of the Great Depression in terms of policy innovation, for example, the international economic system, as we know it today, policy-wise, was basically shaped as a reaction of the Great Depression to a large extent. So in some sense, what we have today is something that really can have huge consequences in the long term, but again, it's extremely important that we consider this as a real opportunity to push forward the frontier in terms of uh, cultural policy innovation to an extent and an ambition that we have never thought of before. And just to, to finish quickly, Another point is public initiative. What is the public hand here? It's not only in terms of uh, incentives and not only in terms of support and transfers, it's also in terms probably again of strategic actions. So far, we have a networked and a heavily platform uh, economy in terms of culture and creative content, but this platform economy is dominated by private interest. And this private interest, as we know, have an enormous power today to influence the functioning of culture and creative production system all over the world. 
in a moment in which we have so many endangered sectors that probably are not directly interesting for uh, private businesses that are only interested in, uh, of course, profitability of certain types of investment, thinking also of uh, public uh, initiative uh, platforms, digital platforms for the provision and circulation of cultural and creative content is probably something to consider very carefully. And uh, the last two words, the first one is complementarity. There is clearly a strong complementarity between uh, culture and other sectors. Education has been mentioned several times. We are also speaking about the welfare sector, but probably there are many more. Again, culture must today break the isolation, not only from the outside, but also from the inside. Sometimes culture is a bit uh, reluctant to really think of this uh, structural interconnection, but this is the moment now to really think of them seriously. And finally, globalization. As um, Philippe said, we are today an incredibly globalized uh, cultural uh, uh, ecosystem in the sense that we are able to access contents produced just everywhere. This platform economies and the digital dimension from this point of view is really creating an incredible, amazing space in which it's not only a few countries that play as the content and innovation leader in the culture and creative industry that make uh, the menu for people now it's really there is really the possibility to have a huge diversified access to an incredible amount of different kind of uh, spectacular culture and creative content this is again something that we should uh, be willing to capitalize on to create uh, a global culture and uh, creative exchange space that is enabled by the digital possibilities to an extent that we have never seen before. So there is a huge possibility ahead. There is also a huge crisis. I hope that uh, this uh, panel uh, discussion, of course, did not solve the, the problems, but at least gave us some inspiration on how to move uh, for the next steps. So I give back the floor to Katia for the closure of the seminar. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pierre Luigi. Uh, I would like to uh, um, thank our speakers, of course. Uh, let me try to maybe switch our. Voilà. Uh, yes, so thank you so much to our speakers uh, and partners. Uh, and I would like to also to mention a, a special word to our uh, Venice uh, partners, the Fundazione di Venezia and the Union Camera del Regione Veneto, who support our work on culture and host um, our office uh, there. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, speakers, partners, and also participants. And uh, uh, of course, we will circulate the video recording of the webinar pretty soon, uh, hopefully next Monday, uh, and we'll uh, stay in touch for the questions and further further information as well. In terms of upcoming events, uh, well, uh, we have at the end of the month our online Academy for Creative uh, and Cultural Industries. Uh, and you can still, uh, you can still have like 24 hours to apply if you are interested. And then uh, we uh, will, uh, we are launching a, a project with the European Commission on culture, creative economy and local development, which of course was designed before the crisis erupted and will now, we're now thinking how to refocus it a little bit. Uh, uh, but we will be holding a number of policy seminars in the coming months uh, uh, on very important uh, themes like skills, ecosystems, business support ecosystems for creative industries uh, and funding arts and culture. And of course, uh, we will uh, tackle a lot uh, uh, the issues that were mentioned uh, today. And we'll focus also a lot on the work on the data and more evidence, better and more data to support policy making, especially in this very challenging uh, times. And we'll be doing this with a consortium of uh, cities and regions who joined uh, and would hopefully mo join more this, uh, this, this, uh, this project. So with this, I would like to thank you all and stay safe. Goodbye.